Hello, and welcome to the first lecture in History 361, African American History to 1877. I am Professor Bronstein at New Mexico State University, and I am going to be taking you through a series of lectures that deal with the time period up until 1877, starting from the age of the great West African empires. Ghana, Mali, and Songhai were powerful West African kingdoms that exerted great influence over the de development of the region uh, from which people would mostly come from Africa to North America, which is why we're starting in West Africa. Ghana, the oldest documented West African state, was founded about 300 AD, and it was prominent between 830 and 1230 AD. The people of Ghana called their empire Wagadu, and it was ruled over by a single king, the father of the Soninke people. When a king died, he was succeeded on the throne by the son of his sister. Ghana, not to be confused with the current African country of Ghana, became a wealthy empire due to the presence of iron and gold. The artisans of Ghana forged iron into swords and lances that enabled them to conquer their neighbors who were using wooden clubs. By the late 600s, Arab conquerors moving across Africa heard stories about large supplies of gold and fabulously wealthy African kingdoms, but when they attempted to invade Ghana, they were repelled by the Ghanaian army. While Ghana was not conquered by Arab forces, the extent of the great nation's power was documented by Arab scholars in residence. They reported that in 1067, the king of Ghana could muster a force of 200,000 soldiers and that he used these troops to force other nearby kingdoms to affiliate under the Ghanaian banner. In addition to being a strong state militarily, the empire had become wealthy due to its ability to trade gold and salt for the contents of camel caravans that were passing through. There was so much gold flowing around Ghana from West African gold fields that the king tried to hold some out of circulation by mandating that only he could own gold nuggets. While the gold was mined by independent tribes, the salt was mined by enslaved people who were kept in poor conditions at the mouth of the Tagaza salt mines. The king also taxed profits on trade at the market in Ghana's main city, Kumbi, which may have housed as many as 30,000 people. And you can see the ruined city there in present-day Mauritania. Ghana eventually fell uh, when a reformist sect of Islam swept through Africa in the 11th century. And the destruction of Ghana led to the emergence of Mali, which had been one of Ghana's affiliated kingdoms. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Mali. Sundiata emerged as the founder of the Mali Empire, overthrowing a local despot, and he took over the gold fields that had once belonged to Ghana, and not only that, transformed the agricultural basis of West Africa by branching out into having the people grow sorghum, rice, yam, beans, taro root, and onions, and raising poultry, cattle, sheep, and go goats. The Mali Empire prospered for about three generations, but then it decayed into infighting until finally another great leader named Musa emerged. Musa was referred to as Mansa Musa, and he was extremely famous. As you can see here, he was depicted by Europeans in maps and such. He expanded the borders of the Mali, Mali Empire, promoted art and education, and most notably made a pilgrimage to Mecca with a huge entourage of camels laden with gold dust and as many as 60,000 people. He reached Cairo in July 1324 
and made a huge impression on everyone, distributing gold freely and putting Molly on the map. Tangentially, Mansa Musa appears in some late medieval paintings of the Nativity. He is often depicted as one of the three wise men who came to see the baby Jesus in the manger. Uh, the Empire of Mali had several important cities, including Timbuktu. When Mansa Musa died in 1332, the empire declined again because his son was not an effective leader. The final Great West African Empire, the Songhai Empire, had its center on the Niger River slightly to the east of historical Mali and Ghana. The people there were a mix of the native Africans and Berber nomads, and the leaders of the Songhai Empire had converted to Islam. As Mali declined, Songhai leaders attacked its cities, including Timbuktu, which was captured in 1468, and Jenna, another seat of Islamic scholarship, which was captured in 1473. The leader of the Songhai Empire at the time was a man called Sunni Ali. He was a good strategist and divided the empire up into provinces, each under the supervision of a governor. After Sunni Ali and his son and successor died, Askia Muhammad became the next leader of the Songhai Empire and he made a big splash in the world by making a pilgrimage to Mecca in 1495. Shortly after his successful pil pilgrimage though, Berbers from the north of Africa invaded Songhai beginning its downfall. So at right you have the tomb of Askia Muhammad and this map here shows you the location of the three empires that I have been talking about. So you can see Ghana right here, uh, the Mali Empire here, and Songhai slightly to the east of those two empires here. So this is a good map to look at. Um, and it shows you where these empires are located in between the Sahara Desert and the much uh, more fertile sort of tropical zone of Africa. In contrast with the empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, the African societies um, from whom people were most often taken into the Atlantic slave trade were modest in size. So most of the people who would be captured for the slave trade came from these smaller societies. Many of these societies were poly polytheistic. That means they had many gods. Um, they lived in extended families and most of the societies revolved around kinship affiliations. Property and political power was passed down through family lines. There were confederacies of royal families who ruled local villages and kingdoms. But most Africans didn't have either a stable sense of geographical boundaries delimiting where they lived. They didn't see themselves as belonging to states or even to ethnicities or tribes. The extended family was the most important unit. And the second most important divider was social class. The reason people commonly associate pre-colonial Africa with, quote, tribes, unquote, is that the Europeans expected to find tribes and they imposed tribehood on the people that they saw. Ironically, when European powers began to lose their colonial control of Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries, Africans themselves kind of bought into tribal identities because their own history had been swallowed up by colonialism. Land ownership in West Africa was collective. Individuals didn't own land, and so as a result, power and wealth were calculated in terms of people and not land. So how many people were 
in your orbit? How many people were under your control? People usually lived in villages and village leaders would allocate as much land to each family as they thought that they could cultivate in a given year. When the land got used up, the entire village would be moved. There you see women mashing yams, one of the main staple foods in West Africa, which can be made into a kind of almost a, a pudding, I guess much in the same way you'd make masa for tortillas. Despite being generally dry, the land of these West African small societies could be used for growing various crops, millet, sorghum, groundnuts, quite similar to peanuts, indigo, and corn. There were also peoples of Africa who raised cattle and they practiced what um, anthropologists call transhumans, moving their herds with the seasons to take advantage of food sources. In some areas, cattle served as a form of currency. So your, your wealth was measured in how many cattle you had and you could also, or would have to, pay a bride price upon marriage that is to get a certain number of cattle. There was differentiation of labor, however. There were, for example, hereditary occupational groups of artisans, including iron workers, silversmiths, goldsmiths, woodworkers, leather workers, entertainers, and storytellers, whose job it was to pass down the oral traditions of the group. In terms of their religion, these groups had several notable, notable beliefs. First of all, uh, many of them believed that the spirits of the dead lived in a realm under the land that they reached by crossing a large body of water. And when they died, they changed color becoming white. So Europeans were initially sometimes uh, viewed as ghosts and the traveling over the large body of water was sort of very fearful for people as they traveled across the Atlantic because, you know, this is how you got to the land of the dead. Many of the people believed in a series of orishas or gods, each of which embodied some natural force, thunder and lightning, for example, or the earth or warfare, or the crossroads. Um, so these Orishas embodied a lot of different forces in the same way that, you know, the same holds true for some Native American beliefs. Finally, it's important to note that there was great linguistic and cultural diversity amongst the peoples of West Central Africa. Uh, not only could they often not communicate with each other, but just as with native peoples in the Americas, they often didn't see themselves as having anything in common with neighboring people. And there you see some Orishas with offerings placed in front of them, um, the giving of offerings, uh, often a part of African religious ceremonies and also funerals. Now there was internal slavery in West Africa for several reasons. Sometimes slavery was a byproduct of war. So conquering people uh, enslaved their enemies who in turn were used as laborers and kept as concubines. Slavery was also used as a punishment for serious crimes such as adultery, murder, and sorcery and some West Africans were forced into slavery to pay off their debts. On the other hand, Muslim leaders captured non-Muslims from all over the world to be slaves, irrespective of skin color. It is estimated that from the year 650 to the year 1600, 12 million individuals were enslaved either within Africa or in the areas surrounding the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. And uh, when I quote that number, that 12 million individuals number, that is um, enslaved people captured by Muslims. 
Enslaved people were kept as concubines or eunuchs. Eunuchs are, generally speaking, guards of harems or other places where women are kept. And uh, the eunuchs have been castrated so that they can't impregnate the women and kind of uh, represent a, a threat to the legitimacy of the dynasty. Um, enslaved people, enslaved by the Muslims, were also drafted into armies to fight for Muslim states and were put to work in copper mines and salt mines. It is clear from medieval Islamic writings that slaves were looked down upon, but the development of Islamic slavery into a racial category took hundreds of years. Now, one of the big questions that always comes up in the early history of the African diaspora is what were the differences between slavery in and around Africa and later slavery in the Americas? It should be noted that while slavery was practiced in West Africa, the system was relatively fluid. Slaves could work off debt. Concubines, that is women who were in relationships with men and bore them children, Concubines were granted freedom when they bore a free man's child. Some slaves were adopted into their owner's kinship networks as a result of marriage, or slaves could be freed. But more important still is the fact that in Africa, slave status was not generally inherited. A permanent class of slaves or slave owners did not exist, and slavery was also not associated with skin color. To put it another way, West African slaves were socially marginal and powerless, but there were limits to their subjugation. They were even granted certain civic rights and privileges. Despite the fact that the West African practice of slavery was very different from the slavery that developed in the Americas, the internal African slave trade did one thing. It opened the door for trading African captives with Europeans. So the Europeans are going to arrive in a milieu where slavery already exists and a slave trade is happening. Historians then argue about who's responsible for the slave trade, but in the words of the historian Michael Gomez, quote, culpability was shared, but was it symmetrical and does the answer matter? The, my answer to this is probably not, you know, slavery was a heinous practice no matter how it got started and no matter who shares the responsibility for it. And as we're going to see, the transatlantic slave trade perpetuates um, terrible injustices, death and uh, genocide, pretty much. So we're going to be hearing about that in future lectures. Okay, see you in the comments.